Life is not about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. You must make the choice to take the chance if you want anything in life to change. Welcome you one and all for joining the eighth session of second phase AICTE sponsored one week short term training program on basic of remote sensing, geographical information system and global navigation satellite system. This is Dainisha, assistant professor in the department of civil engineering. On behalf of Francis Xavier Engineering College, an autonomous institution in Tirunal Valley, and Department of Civil Engineering, I thank each and everyone for joining today's session. Success is not just about what you accomplish in your life. It's about what you inspire others to do. It's my proud privilege for me to welcome and introduce an eminent personality as our guest speaker. We are delighted to have the sculpture of human character, Dr. Alok Bharadwaj, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Roorkee. He did his B.Tech in Civil Engineering from G.B. Pan University of Agriculture and Technology in the year 2012 and obtained his M.Tech from IIT Bombay in 2013. He completed his Ph.D. from National University of Singapore in 2018. Prior to joining IIT Roorkee as an assistant professor, he was working as a postdoctoral fellow at the Earth Observatory of Singapore, Nanyang Technology University. During his postdoctoral, he was working in collaboration with Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA, to develop deep learning based logarithms using radar remote sensing to study flood events in Asia. He is a National Geographic Explorer and is supported by National Geographic Society to conduct flood research in Asia. He is expertized in the research areas of remote sensing and deep learning techniques to study urban floods, rain, induced landslides, and understanding the link between climate telecommunication connections and occurrence of extreme rainfall events and ensuring floods in Asia. We are certainly grateful to him for accepting our invitation humbly and gladly to become the guest speaker for this session. We are really thankful to an idol of knowledge, Dr. Aluk Bharatwaj sir, for taking the time out of his busy schedule to present this session. On behalf of Department of Civil Engineering and on my own behalf, I welcome you sir. Participants, we are looking forward on your active participation. I ensure the session will be profitable and fruitful for everyone present here. Welcome you one and all. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time to our guest speaker. Over to you, sir. Uh, OK, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, such a nice introduction. Uh, I, I hope I'm worthy of it. Uh, and also, uh, congratulations to Francis Xavier uh, Engineering College for organizing uh, this uh, uh, short-term uh, training program uh, in this uh, pandemic time and giving every one of us the opportunity to, to learn from each other and continue uh, growing our knowledge. And also giving thank you for giving me this opportunity to present on uh, one of the topics of, of remote sensing, which is known as the introduction to microwave remote sensing. Uh, I will share my screen now uh, so that uh, uh, I can start my presentation. So may I request the host to confirm uh, if you are able to see my screen? Yes, sir. OK. OK, great. So as uh, it was rightly said that uh, it is about inspiring others, so I hope uh, I'm able to uh, provide a little bit of an inspiration among all of the attendees uh, in this uh, seminar about microwave remote sensing. So the topic is uh, about introduction to microwave remote sensing. Uh, I have included the material uh, that uh, introduces this topic uh, to the people. Uh, I'm not, uh, I will not delve into much details uh, because it's an introductory lecture. 
And uh, I hope from this lecture, uh, people will understand what uh, microwave remote sensing is. And I I'm sure in the audience, there are certain experts and, uh, and, and uh, who are uh, doing microwave remote sensing. But uh, more or less uh, about uh, in, in most of the seminars, about 50% of, uh, of the attendees uh, are less familiar about what a microwave remote sensing is and uh, what are they what are its applications so i hope uh, i will uh, so i will try my best to introduce this topic to you and i hope you enjoy the presentation uh, as will i do <laughs> okay so the contents of the presentation is uh, of course the introduction to the microwave remote sensing uh, some of the historical developments uh, that led uh, to uh, the use of microwave remote sensing, the widespread use of it. Uh, some of the missions, the radar missions. So uh, radar is one of the ways uh, the microwaves uh, remote sensing is, ba is made possible. Uh, so we will see what are the different missions uh, that are in, in current practice and what are the different types of uh, microwave remote sensing sensors. And uh, finally, uh, I will introduce you to INSAR, so which is interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar. It's a, a very well-known uh, uh, method to use the microwave microwaves to study the uh, uh, to study about our Earth. And I will also introduce uh, some of the examples uh, of the use of INSAR in uh, research and also in other areas. So because uh, this is on, uh, on the short term course on uh, basics of remote sensing and other subjects, so I hope uh, you, a lot of the people in the audience are familiar uh, with, the, with the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, but just for a recap, uh, I will just uh, tell you that uh, the spectrum is divided into, <clears throat> is roughly divided into, into various uh, subparts. Uh, starting, if you can see the, my, my mouse cursor, it starts from gamma ray up to X-rays, uh, ultraviolet, uh, visible band. Uh, that is where our eyes are uh, uh, are programmed to see the world. Uh, our inf infrared. Then it goes to microwaves, and then finally radio waves. So uh, our aim today is to understand what these microwaves are. And as you can see here, the wavelength it keeps on increasing as you move from gamma rays to the radio waves. And uh, similarly, when the, it is increasing, the frequency is decreasing, as you can see here. So microwaves are usually of a wavelength of about one centimeters to about one meters. And then it goes into the radio waves. However, it has a, a lower frequency than the frequency you see in the visible and in the other ultraviolet and x-rays so as i have written here microwaves provide a unique view of the earth's environment uh, that is not possible to obtain in other ways and what is that unique view uh, we will see now okay so one of the advantages of microwaves is that uh, it is able to get transmitted through the atmosphere, okay, which is uh, uh, very much needed to, to, to study the, the uh, to study about our Earth. So as you can see, if the, when the wavelength is increasing and it is moving from one centimeter to about thirty centimeters, which is where we define what are what are the wavelengths of the microwaves, you can see the transmission is almost near to ninety to almost closing to 100%. So that implies that uh, the microwaves are able to transmit uh, through that atmosphere. Some of uh, the transmission is hindered or absorbed by water vapors. So that is why they are known as water vapor absorption bands. If you go into the uh, uh, lower wavelengths, you will see that the transmission is much lower here. And uh, those are mostly absorbed by the oxygen gas. But the, the thing that we need to understand from this figure is this, that microwaves having a transmission, a, a very high transmission, it can penetrate through the atmosphere and reach the surface of the Earth. So that is why microwaves are very useful in understanding about the characteristics of our Earth. 
So what is uh, unique about microwaves? So as I was shown in the previous uh, satellite, microwaves can penetrate through clouds. So this is one snapshot of uh, the average cloudiness over Earth in April 2015, which was seen from the Equa satellite. And this image was obtained uh, from uh, Dr. Sang Ho Yun, uh, who is a, a geophysicist in the radar section in JPL in NASA. So if, as you can see in this figure, uh, the more uh, uh, the more uh, darker the the hue of the uh, or you can say the color, the more uh, it is darker here. You can see it. so on an average, uh, you can see that the the Earth is covered by clouds, right? And uh, you understand that uh, it is uh, uh, really difficult to see what are the features on the ground if you are using optical satellites. Okay, uh, because uh, the optical satellites cannot, the signal cannot penetrate through the clouds. However, uh, as I showed you in the previous slide, microwaves are not hindered by this. They can penetrate through the clouds. So this is one of the uniqueness about the microwaves that can penetrate through the cloud. What is the other uh, advantage of microwave? Uh, the other thing is that microwaves do not rely on sun for the source of illumination. So there are sensors nowadays that use that use their own source of uh, illumination, and uh, those are known as active sensors. They have their own power to shoot the microwaves towards the Earth and observe it. So as you can see here, that at any given time, time fifty percent of the Earth is dark. So optical satellites cannot work in the dark regions because it depends on the sun's reflectance from the Earth. So microwaves give, give you uh, the extra information that it can work in the night as well because it has its own source of illumination. Okay, so now we have seen that microwaves can work during all weather, uh, whether if there are, it, is, it is sunny, whether it is cloudiness, as seen here, it can penetrate through the clouds, and it can also work during night. Uh, so it has, it can work during day as well as night. So you have got these uh, sensors with microwaves that can work 24/7, all, all, uh, uh, all through the week, all through the months and year. Um, uh, without, it can work in the night, it can work in the day, it can work when there are clouds, it can work when there are no clouds. So you have got this uh, this uh, this uh, fantastic uh, uh, wavelength uh, that you can use to sense to understand about the Earth. So it, so now when you understand what are the advantages of microwave, then it feels like uh, to understand more about micro microwave, so that you can either use uh, this technique in your research or in your uh, in your other works as well. Okay, so let us see more about this. Uh, what are more uniqueness about the microwaves? So as you can see on the left uh, graph, so as you increase the wavelength, uh, the one-way transmission almost increases, right? So uh, uh, the, the microwaves can penetrate through the clouds if it has a wavelength of about uh, from, uh, from six to nine centimeters. It is so uh, at the top of the clouds, uh, there are either water clouds or ice clouds, right? So it can penetrate through these, these clouds and reach the surface of the earth. Say, for example, if there is a uh, uh, rainfall is happening, uh, uh, this, then, then uh, the microwaves can still function. If you can see here for the, for the given wavelength, when it is increasing uh, during a heavy rain, uh, the transmission is almost near to 90 to 100 percent. So what does th this imply? It implies that the microwaves can also are not hindered by the rainfall itself. Either it's a light drizzle or it's a heavy rain. Some of uh, the wave microwaves of this particular wavelength can still work in, in, in rainfall periods. So this is the another thing that microwaves can also work during a rainfall when the rainfall is happening. Okay. So what is the other uh, uniqueness about uh, microwaves? Given the wavelength of the microwaves, waves, it can either be used to study about the vegetation on the Earth. 
So as you can see, so this is the, the red denotes a signal, <clears throat> a microwave signal that is coming from the sensor and hitting the, the upper parts of the canopy. So when the signal is, uh, is scattered and is received by the sensor again, uh, the information about the structure of the canopy that reflects this signal can be understood. So in this way, uh, the, the microwaves of one centimeter wavelength can be used to study about the uh, shape and to study about the characteristics of the tree canopies. And because India has uh, such a vast forest cover, uh, microwaves uh, are very useful to understand about the structure of of these forest uh, the the structure of the of the of, of the upper canopy of the forest if you have microwaves which are of higher wavelength so it can penetrate more inside the canopy and it can give you the information which is beneath the canopy from the trunk how how like what is the structure of the trunks because it depends on the scattering of the waves from it. So based on the scattering here, you can understand the structure of the of of the trees below the canopy, right? Because it says that it's, it's a signal from the crown, from the trunks. Even they are certain it is able to penetrate through the trees and hit the ground. So you can also understand what is uh, beneath the uh, the tree canopy, given an optical satellite so uh, uh, so i'm uh, so as i'm moving along i'm comparing the microwave with the optical satellites but but i am it's not that i uh, it's like uh, i'm promoting microwaves and uh, i'm disliking optical it's uh, i'm trying to explain what are the advantages of uh, of microwaves over optical of course optical uh, remote sensing is very very useful but in certain cases uh, microwaves are very useful which i'm just telling you now so for example, if you take an optical image, in an optical image, you see uh, the structure uh, of, of, of the forest. When, when you take a picture, when you take uh, the, the photograph of, 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 uh, of a forested area, but you cannot know what is uh, beneath that canopy. Using microwaves, you can actually understand what is the beneath, uh, what is the below the canopy layer. Is it, is it, uh, you can understand whether uh, there are floods, there is water beneath the canopy, you can understand whether it's dry uh, beneath the canopy. So these are the different things that, that you can understand. If you see below picture, uh, it uh, not only, it also helps, microwave also helps you to understand uh, the, the, the structure of the crops. So based on the crop, uh, that's the, uh, for example, the signal which is coming from the wheat. So here the wheat is one type of crop. So whether that signal is coming from the wheat or from the soil or, uh, or whether it's, it's completely coming from the soil uh, beneath the, the wheat. So it is, uh, uh, so based on the scattering characteristics of these kinds of structures, you can, by studying the scattered waves, because these waves are scattered, because when it hits the ground, it gets scattered and uh, you receive uh, these scattered waves so you can understand uh, what are the characteristics of the wheat uh, of the crop and the soil uh, where the crop is growing so this is another uniqueness of, of microwaves okay so now we understood uh, that what are the major dis major advantages of microwaves that it is an all weather uh, day and night sensor that can be used to study about the earth, you can use it in many, many applications. But also it is uh, equally important to, un to understand that how this technology came about to be. And uh, the, the things that uh, I'm telling you now, uh, when it all started. So uh, I would like to mention some of the great scientists here uh, who have uh, given their, uh, uh, their, uh, 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 their life to understanding the different aspects of, uh, uh, of the physics of uh, um, light, of the physics of, uh, uh, of electricity and magnetism that ultimately led to our current understanding of uh, the microwaves and how we use uh, these uh, microwaves to our, uh, uh, in, in, our, in our own work. So starting from Galwani, he was a famous scientist uh, who did uh, a lot of work in bioelectricity. 
and uh, you will be surprised not surprised but it will be good to know uh, but uh, because i didn't knew this uh, before that uh, the word galvanization which uh, we study in our science textbooks in uh, in in either 10th or in the 10th class uh, in high schools was uh, is based on the name of this great scientist galvani so from here the concept of electricity came thomas young uh, was a great scientist who gave us the young double slit experiment so in the physics uh, you must have uh, learned about interference right so thomas young uh, uh, gave a, a great push to understanding what interference is uh, augustine J john uh, fresnel also uh, uh, helped in understanding that uh, the light travels as a wave okay so he uh, he he discovered that light also traveled as a wave michael faraday further pushed the ideas of augustine john john fresnel to tell that uh, uh, that light is uh, uh, the wave that is traveling it's uh, made up of uh, both electric and magnetic components okay uh, james clerk maxwell uh, pushed pushed uh, uh, further the idea of michael faraday for uh, understanding that uh, light uh, light travels as an electromagnetic radiation that there are oscillating perpendicular uh, fields of electricity and of uh, ma of magnetic electricity and magnetic uh, <coughs> oscillations that helps uh, the, the uh, that, that is included in the light when it is traveling uh, from uh, in, into the space and also traveling in the medium in the atmosphere and uh, if you have studied in your physics textbooks the maxwell's four great equations uh, so that those four great equations on electromagnetism of light was given by james clerk maxwell uh, marconi was uh, uh, an instrumental scientist in uh, uh, use use using the radio waves because now when you understand that the light can travel as both electricity has both electric and magnetic components uh, you can use it uh, to 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 transfer the information from one point to the other so uh, marconi uh, uh, was instrumental in uh, in the use of radio waves in sending the signals alexander alexander graham bell so you use uh, so earlier so nowadays uh, the students they use mobile phones and all these things but earlier like in 80s and 90s i remember uh, like in early 90s we used to have a, a phone with a wire in our home we used to use that phone at that time i studied that it was uh, alexander graham bell that was uh, that was not the first scientist to 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 discover the the telephone but he was the first to uh, to register his patent for using the telephone so and in fact his surname bell is uh, nowadays a very famous unit that is used in microwave remote sensing that we call as decibel so some of the audience uh, if they are familiar with the microwave remote sensing they must have used uh, the the unit decibel that is where the origin is from alexander graham bell henrich hertz uh, you must have learned that the unit of frequency is hertz so henrich hertz was uh, instrumental in proving uh, through experiments the equations of james clerk maxwell so that so the james clerk maxwell gave the theory of electromagnetic radiation but it was henrich hertz who actually proved the the theory using uh, the experiments that is did that he did in his lab and then uh, then finally it, uh, sir robert Watt, watson watt came and uh, made uh, the mainstream radar uh, what, what is we have today? Okay, so there was some disturbance. Is was there any question? Okay, so Sir Robert Watson, what uh, gave us the uh, what we call gig, uh, as the the radar that we have today um, that uses the microwave remote sensing? Okay, and it was Carl. A Willy, the the final piece in the in the puzzle uh, that helped to understand uh, what uh, what is a synthetic aperture radar, and he developed the technique of synthetic aperture radar that is used 
uh, nowadays in all microwave uh, remote sensing sensors that all that all the scientists who are working in this field use so these are some of the people that were instrumental in uh, bringing microwaves to the world so as you can see here so back in 1935 when it was the period of world war 2 uh, you can see these towers right so these towers are the radars so this is a transmitting uh, radar and the towers that you see on the side are the receiving radars so this whole project was uh, known as chain home so it was uh, built by uk to uh, detect the fighter jets which were coming towards their country so they they use the microwaves they send the signal to detect uh, any aircrafts that were coming in the air and uh, in the and then uh, moving forward in 1943 uh, the radar was made public so uh, the, the civilian use of the radar came into uh the application and as you can see here the the one of the first ground mapping radar was used here in 1943 on an airplane right uh in 1943 uh some of uh, the scientists from JPL jet propulsion laboratory in NASA used the microwaves to measure the distance to the planet Venus uh using uh, the radars and that radar used the microwaves and the first uh, large scale civilian application of airborne imaging radar was to map darien Pro province in panama in 1967 so as you can see here uh, this uh, darien province was not mapped earlier uh, using other techniques such as optical remote sensing but it was the uh, it was the imaging radar which could penetrate through the cloud cover and could map the the topography below that cloud cover and was able to determine the boundaries of the darien province in panama in 1967 and then uh, the first uh, civilian uh, space borne imaging synthetic aperture radar which was known as csat was launched in 1978 and you can see this long antenna here so this antenna was used so this is the microwave uh, antenna on the sea set which was used in 1978 to map the ocean floor and it worked for a few months uh, so but it proved that uh, the space the at the that the space borne imaging synthetic aperture radars uh, was possible and they can be used for scientific uses So here I finish uh, the historical developments of the SAR. I hope you get a taste of uh, where the like how many great scientists were involved uh, in many different aspects of bringing microwaves uh, to the present uh, from to the present use that we use today. So these uh, so next I would like to also tell you some of the historical uh, and also upcoming radar missions that are used uh, to study uh, the earth using microwaves. So this is ERS one two radar set one and we set radar set two and reset uh, reset was is an Indian satellite uh, radar set is a Canadian satellite uh, ERS is uh, the European satellites Sentinel one A and one B um, I'm sure the people in the audience uh, must have heard of uh, the Sentinel satellites here uh, they or they might be using in their own work you have radar set constellation also. right so these are the new uh, satellites that are uh, that are still in 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 operation uh, you can see uh, uh, like there are other satellites like elos and elos2 and elos uh, so these are satellites from the japan space agency nisar is an upcoming uh, uh, space mission uh, a sar mission which is a uh, uh, collaboration between nasa and isro to use this sar for uh, understanding of the different features on the earth so this is an upcoming mission probably it will be launched next year or maybe in 20, early 2022 uh, so uh, a lot of hopes are based on nisar mission that it will provide a lot of data for us to for scientists like like me and others to use or to understand more about the earth
And then from uh, Italian space agency, we have Terrasar, uh, cause uh, Terrasar X and Tandem DES X. And also from German space agency, we have these satellites that are used. So as you can see that in the in the right column, you have uh, it's written as X band, L band, and C band. So these are the different wavelengths uh, that are used in these satellites. So C band, L band, and X band are the different satellites, uh, different wavelengths uh, uh, that are used in these satellites or uh, in these SAR missions. So this is a journal overview. Uh, nowadays, uh, Sentinel. One in one B is free to use. Uh, if you want to explore more about it, you can go uh, to the European Space Agency satellite uh, space agency website and uh, read about Sentinel One uh, A and One B, and then uh, you can use this in your own research as well. Uh, Elos Two is not freely available, but you can apply it through writing like a research project. Uh, these all are Terrasar X and Cosmos SkyMed are not free, and they are. Uh, they cost money to buy these images, but they have a very high resolution as compared to ELOS-2 and Sentinel satellites. Okay. So now let's uh, dig a little deeper of uh, on microwave remote sensing. So these sensors that we have, they either uh, they either fly in an ascending orbit or a descending orbit. Okay, so the ascending orbit goes from the uh, south to the north, and the ascending orbit goes from the nor north to the south. And they take a lot of uh, swaths, a lot of paths to cover the whole of the Earth. Uh, these are the two uh, ascending and descending orbits that are used um, in, um, in microwave remote sensing. Uh, and also, they are very useful when you order data. Uh, whether that did, you want data in ascending or in descending uh, orbits. And usually these orbits are at a height of about uh, 500 to 800 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Okay, and usually these paths are polar orbits. Uh, so these are the polar orbits uh, in which you have the ascending and the descending orbits. Okay. So this is uh, uh, another way to understand uh, what are the uh, what are the different sensors that uses the microwave remote sensing. So either uh, those sensors are passive, uh, which means that they use the uh, scattered energy uh, from the surface of the Earth, or they are either active. So active implies that they use their own source of illumination to send the, the, the signals to the Earth and receive the, the scattered signals back. So the passive uh, uh, microwave sensors uh, includes radiometers and sounders, which are real aperture. And uh, the other is uh, uh, the synthetic aperture, one dimensional and two dimensional uh, sensors. Uh, we will understand what a real and synthetic aperture is in the upcoming slides. Uh, the other is uh, the active sensors. The active sensors are also divided into either they are real aperture or synthetic aperture. Uh, a lot of people use uh, scatterometer and altimeters, which are real aperture uh, microwave sensors. And for synthetic aperture, they use uh, uh, mostly they use space spawn synthetic aperture radar uh, missions. But there are other options for using the synthetic aperture, such as uh, inverse synthetic aperture radar and interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radars. So these are is broadly uh, the classification of the different microwave sensors that we have. Uh, uh, if you are working in an active area, you can uh, most definitely be working with the either the synthetic aperture radar or interferometric synthetic aperture radar. If you are working in real aperture, you would be mostly working with scatterometer and altimeters. Uh, a lot of other scientists have uh, uh, interest in using the passive sensors. So they use either microwave radiometers or sounders. OK, so uh, let me give you a few examples of the scatterometer and the altimeter here, which is a real aperture uh, radars, which are also active radars. OK. So uh, nowadays, uh, there is a mission, which is uh, Soil Moisture Active Passive, which we call as SMAP. 
So SMAP is used to measure the soil moisture on the surface of the earth. And this is one of the radar, uh, SMAP radar image, which was acquired from uh, data uh, from uh, which was collected between March and April in 2015. And uh, you can see here that uh, the weaker radar signals, which are the negative values, which uh, implies, uh, and you can see DB here, right? So as I mentioned, Alexander Graham Bell, DB. So this is known as the decibel. So the negative values of these uh, decibels are, uh, indicate uh, the weaker signals. And by weaker signal, it means that there is a low soil moisture on the surface of the earth such as uh, areas like such as desert so and uh, the red part here which has a uh, uh, a higher values indicate that the soil moisture is there on the surface of the earth so let us take uh, india for example on this and you can see that in this particular area where you see the my mouse cursor is uh, slightly bluish in color so this indicates uh, that there is less moisture here which is also true because this area denotes the area of Rajasthan, right? And the rest of the areas, uh, if you see here, and maybe in Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, where uh, the Francis Xavier College is, you can see that there is a lot of soil moisture in this area. So there is because, and you can see there's a lot of greenery around your campus as well. So this uh, is one of these snapshots here. So in between this, in 2015, that shows that uh, how the uh, soil moisture is distributed uh, around the world. Uh, for example, if you see in Africa, it's all blue because it's a desert area. But if you go towards south of uh, the south uh, South Africa, uh, you would see that uh, <clears throat> it is red. It has a red tinge here. So this implies that uh, it is uh, rich in soil moisture, which is also true because here you will see a lot of forest in this area. Okay, uh, the HH uh, normalized uh, radar cross section. Uh, radar cross section is a technical term uh, which indicates uh, that uh, uh, how the objects on the ground scatters the how much uh, energy is scattered by the objects on the ground. And HH is the polarization. Uh, we need not to go into that detail here. Uh, so you just uh, need to know that. Uh, using uh, these techniques, uh, uh, using this polarization and uh, calculating the radar cross-section, you can know ab about uh, the soil moisture on the surface of the Earth. So this is another example of the altimeter. So let me just go back. So we just saw one example of scatterometer. Uh, I will show you another example of altimeter here. So you can see. <clears throat> in dark so in dark is the land area here you can see india australia and everything else is uh, uh, what uh, is the shape of uh, the geoid uh, that is derived from the space bond altimetry so what is an altimeter so altimeter is an instrument uh, that measures the distance uh, between the sensor and the surface of the earth so using these uh, measurements, you can know the fluctuation. Uh, you can know where the mass in the, the gravitational mass uh, on the Earth is higher or lower. And uh, I would like to draw your attention in this area uh, towards the uh, south of India. So this area here, you see it's uh, purple, uh, most purple in the, in the whole of the map. Probably these areas are also purple, but uh, if you look around this region here uh, in, in the Indian Ocean, uh, this area looks uh, very purple. So what does this mean? It means that this area is deeper than the other areas, uh, than the other surrounding areas. And in fact, uh, uh, if you see uh, and go online and search about this, you will know that there is a, a mass anomaly here. So a lot of mass is missing from this area so it is uh, so when you go uh, towards going to the south as you see my point my mouse or mouse mouse uh, mouse pointer you would see that uh, this area is very deep here 
uh, so a lot of uh, mass is not here so the the gravity here is uh, uh, really low okay so this is uh, how you can use the altimeter to understand uh, about uh, the shape of the geoid uh, of the earth okay so next uh, we move to uh, radar okay so what is a radar? Uh, I think most of the people know what a radar is, but uh, just for the sake of the uh, presentation, I would say that radar is stands for radio detection and ranging. Uh, this term was coined at a time when the detection of ships and aircrafts uh, and the determination of their ranges were the primary purpose of radar. Uh, but nowadays, uh, it says that it's radio detection and ranging. But nowadays, you all also use microwaves which are not radio waves but uh, because of the convention that a lot of people are using so we also say that uh, radar uh, also is used term for the sensors that also use microwaves and not radio waves okay so nowadays it's not just about uh, the detection of ships and aircrafts it's also a, a lot more than that uh, it's about understanding the the surface of the earth it's about understanding uh, natural hazards it's uh, about understanding uh, the hydrology of an area it's uh, about understanding the the geology of an area so radar can be used in all of these uh, things so uh so we have a radar with us so what radars can measure so radars can measure the direction uh, using the direction of an antenna. So the radars have antenna and they can point that antenna in a particular direction and then they can receive the signals from that direction. So radars can be used to measure the direction. Uh, radars can also be used to measure the distance. Uh, uh, velocity is equal to distance upon time. Uh, you can measure distance by the multiplication of the the time of travel of the signal to the target and back and multiplied by the velocity of the light. It can be used to measure the speed of the objects. So you must have seen uh, uh, there are radar guns that people use to measure the velocity of the vehicle. So using, so it is a little bit technical. So they use the Doppler shift in the echoes of the objects. So the echoes are the signals that are coming back from the object. So the Doppler shift is a shift in the frequency of those signals that is being received by the receiver. So measuring the shift in the Doppler frequency, you can measure the speed of the object that is coming towards the radar. And it can be also used to measure the scattering cross-section of the object. What, so this uh, radar cross-section here is uh, what we mean by the cross-section of the object here, which can be measured by comparing the returned energy of the echo to the transmitted signal. So you can uh, understand the properties of the objects as well uh, using the radars. Okay, so at this point, I would just like to ask the host uh, if uh, you are able to see the slides and my voice is okay. Then I'll move further. Uh, anyone can say yes if uh, they're able to see my slides and my voice. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now uh, we understand uh, what uh, what is a radar and what are the fundamental quantities that a radar can can be used to measure. Uh, this is a simple uh, radar system that is uh, can be used. So here you will have a transmitter. It can use uh, a switch. So this switch is that you are using the same antenna in the transmitter to transmit as well as receive the signals from the Earth. So this so T stands for uh, transmit and R stands for receive. So it switches between the transmit and receive when you are using the same antenna to transmit. So you're using the same antenna here to transmit and receive the signals. So it uses its own power. 
it sends the signal. Uh, that signal is received back by the antenna. It uh, records and, and then uh, it records these signals. And these signals are sent to the signal processor. So the signal processor is a big component in the radar system, which uh, is used to do signal processing okay, of, the, of the signal that is received by the radar. Uh, so this is a very simple uh, uh, description of a radar system where you use a transmitter to transmit the signal. The signal is received back by the antenna. It switches its mode. It goes into the receiver function. It amplifies the signal. Then it goes into the signal processor. Uh, the signal processor does a lot of raw data processing. So we will not go into the detail of that. Uh, but you understand that there's a lot of signal processing that is happening here. Uh, once that signal processing happens, uh, that this signal, uh, that this processed image is then uh, uh, can be ordered by the users for their own use. OK, so this is a, a, a very interesting and a fun slide that uh, how the radar is used in action. So this is uh, the transmitter receiver, as I just told you. This is the, the uh, antenna that you have. And it sends out this beam. OK, so this beam uh, measure, uh, is uh, covering certain part on the Earth. And uh, the, you can see there's a truck, trees. Uh, there is a shadow by the trees. There is a, a river that is going on, that is, that is flowing from there. So uh, how does that signal looks uh, in the in when it receives the signal? So you would see that uh, you would it would the, the signal would start from here, and as my pointer is moving, uh, uh, it reaches the truck in a similar way. The signal is going here. Uh, the truck reflects the signal back. So you have a high signal out uh, signal input. Then it goes here. Uh, it receives the signal about the trees. Then there is a shadow. The, from the shadow, doesn't receive any signal. From the water, it receives a uh, very less signal because of specular reflection. Uh, from the sloping edge, it again the signal bounces and it receives the signal. And then it's an end of the uh, the whole footprint. In in the middle of these, you will see that there are certain uh, uh, scrubs like uh, uh, grass or the bare earth, for which it also receives the signal. OK, so uh, uh, in this way, the, a, a, a kind of a signal is received uh, by, the, uh, by the radar. And then this signal is, uh, is used in, and this is a raw signal. And this signal is used then in the raw signal processing, uh, in this signal processor, in this, com in this component, to actually make a 2D image of the surface of the Earth. So now here you would see that uh, that uh, using radar is more on the signal processing effort rather than uh, other techniques. Okay. <clears throat> so we have uh, antenna here, and I told you before that this antenna could be a real aperture, and this can also be a synthetic aperture. Okay. So I would just take the liberty to go back here and show you. Uh, so uh, we have active radars here. So now we are just focusing on the active radar. We have a real aperture here, and uh, we also have a synthetic aperture here. Okay, so these are the two divisions of uh, the apertures that are on the uh, that are on the antenna. Okay, so this is a real aperture antenna, and this uh, and there is another known as synthetic aperture antenna. So how are these differentiated? So this here, in this particular example, is a real aperture antenna. And uh, I hope that the audience uh, know what the resolution is, that it is, it is, a, it is a, a quality of a sensor to discriminate two objects on the ground. So the, uh, because the, uh, this, uh, uh, the whole sensor is moving in a certain direction, it has uh, two kinds of resolution. One resolution is uh, in the direction of the travel of the sensor, and the other resolution is in the direction uh, perpendicular to the direction of the motion. 
So we call that uh, a long track direction where the sensor is moving and the, uh, the resolution in the other direction is the across track, di across track resolution. So you see in the real aperture, the along track resolution is, uh, uh, is the antenna bandwidth uh, multiplied by the range. Okay, so if you focus here, so the antenna bandwidth is a certain quantity of property of the antenna itself, uh, and it is multiplied by the range. So if you, if you see that if you increase the range, so the range is the distance from the antenna to a certain target. So when you are moving from the antenna towards uh, the, the, to the farther side, the range is increasing. So that implies that the resolution is also increasing, right? If the resolution is increasing, uh, it would uh, imply that it is becoming coarser and coarser resolution. So uh, any object which is in the farther end from here will have a very coarse resolution. So that is a disadvantage of uh, the real aperture. So how do you deal with that? For to, 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 to deal with that disadvantage, we use synthetic aperture. So in the synthetic aperture, the along track resolution depends only on the antenna length. It does not depend on the mm, on the range. It depends on the length of the antenna. So uh, before we look into what the real aperture and the synthetic aperture resolutions are, I would like to play this video for all of you to understand that how the signal is coming from the sensor microwave sensor, how it is hitting the ground, and how it is reflect scattered back towards the sensor. So you see here, uh, so this animation is fun to watch. So let's just watch this animation. So I will play this again. So you see this, how the signal is coming and it is reflect scattered back and uh, the, the timing when the signal is being received is being recorded in the signal time graph. So you see when this signal is received, then this signal is received. So it receives this signal and this is recorded in the signal time graph. So this is how the signal is being, uh, uh, is being uh, transferred from the sensor. It hits the ground and goes back. So I would just play it once more just for the fun of it. Right, so you now you understand that how the signal is being recorded in the sensor. Okay, so uh, what is the concept of the real aperture radar? So this is the antenna that we have. So this is uh, the antenna length here that we have, and this is the width of the antenna, the L and D. So this is sending the signal, uh, just as we saw here. So this signal you are looking from the from the side view. So this is a signal that is coming from the antenna towards the ground. But if you look this uh, signal in a 3D view, so this signal has two components. It, the one component is in the across track direction where my mouse is moving, and the other is in the uh, along track direction here. So similarly, you have two uh, beam width here. So one beam width is in the across track direction here, which is indicated by beta E. And the other is uh, in the uh, along track direction, which is denoted by beta A. So these are the two beam widths uh, that you use here your, uh, uh, to do the calculation of the resolutions. You use the azimuth beam width. And uh, so this is how the, you use this beam width and the range to calculate the uh, along track resolution. So this is how the beam is coming towards the ground. OK, so this is, as I told you, that uh, the long track resolution is the beam width 
uh, multiplied by the range and uh, the other another resolution is in the uh, along uh, in the across track direction which is uh, <clears throat> c uh, tau p by 2 so what is this so c is the speed of the light uh, tau p is the is the uh, is the is the width of the signal that is coming and uh, it is half so why it is half because it's a two way because the signal is coming from the uh, from the antenna towards the ground and going back so so you have to uh, take the half of this distance to measure the one way distance that you have okay uh, so this is the concept of the rear aperture radar where you have these two resolutions and uh, which is known as the azimuth resolution in the along track direction and the range resolution in the across track direction one thing to note here is uh, this uh, along track resolution which has a component of r in it so as you are moving away from the sensor the resolution is increasing because it is being multiplied by r every time when you are moving away from the sensor okay so as you move away from the sensor this whole product keeps on increasing in value so th because this is a resolution so uh, it will imply that the resolution is becoming coarser and co coarser here so what what to do about this so then it comes the concept of synthetic aperture radar okay so uh, in the along track direction we saw that uh, the uh the resolution is uh, lambda r by l so how did we get this uh so beta is lambda by l and you multiply that by the range here okay so this is lambda by l into r which is the real aperture resolution it turns out that uh, the same resolution when we use the synthetic aperture radar is l by 2 only it does not depend on the range so this is a this is a great uh, uh uh advantage or uh, a great step up from the from the real aperture that the resolution is not becoming coarser as you are moving away from the antenna or from the sensor and depends only on the length of the antenna so for example if the length of the antenna is 5 meters the along track resolution for this synthetic aperture would be 2.5 meters which will be constant uh, <clears throat> for uh, for all the ranges here so uh, how does uh, the synthetic aperture radar uh, is used so it is based on the uh, on the on the synthesis of the synthetic aperture that's why it's known as synthetic it's not real so uh, you see the sensor here so it is uh, moving in this direction uh, this is the antenna that the sensor has uh one of the antennas if you just take uh, a single antenna that is the real aperture because a single antenna is being used that is why it says the resolution of a real aperture is 2 km if you only use this antenna but if you use the signals and the transmitted and the received signals from all of these antennas right such that uh, the the object is uh, is in in the whole length of this uh, synthetic aperture uh, it would imply that uh, you are making measurements not with this small antenna but with a long antenna okay so now the the length of the synthetic aperture is uh, is now about 2 km so here the the antenna length has increased okay so it implies that you can have a lot of transmitted and received signals for the same object using the different antennas that you have so you can process these signals and uh, you can uh, through derivation of certain mathematical formulas you come about that uh, the the resolution would be would only depend on the length of one antenna which is uh, l and the resolution would be l by 2 okay so uh, earlier when you were using the real aperture the resolution was 2 km 
But using the synthetic aperture concept, uh, the length uh, of the antenna is eight meters, so it's is uh, one half of that. So uh, the resolution becomes four meter. So the resolution is increased by tremendous amount from uh, two kilometers to four meters. So this is the concept and the advantage of using synthetic aperture radar uh, for using in microwave remote sensing. Okay, so I hope this was a heavy slide, uh, but uh, the, the takeaway or the message from this slide is that instead of uh, using the real aperture radar, it's best to use a synthetic aperture radar because it increases the along track resolution uh, by tremendous amount. Okay, so now when you are using uh, the synthetic aperture radar, so this SAR is a short form for synthetic aperture radar, you are making a measurement of phase. Okay, so now what is a phase here? So uh, I will just show you with an illustration. Uh, so this is a satellite that you have with you, okay? So the signal from the satellite is going towards the Earth and it is being reflected back, okay? Suppose uh, the, there was uh, no earthquake here, an earthquake happened and then the satellite again uh, visited the same region but now the mass of the area has changed the surface conditions has changed so now the length of the signal that it will receive from the ground has increased by this blue amount okay so to track how much of this distance has, incre has increased or how much of this uh, distance the signal is traveling, uh, the extra distance the signal is traveling, you can obtain this by measurement of the phase of the signal. Okay, so what does that uh, mean, the, the phase of the signal? So for example, you have uh, a sensor here, that sensor sends out the beam this beam measures and it goes back. So the phase of the signal is uh, uh, minus four pi by lambda into r. Uh, the derivation is uh, simple. It's uh, that in, in one wavelength, uh, 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 the in two pi makes a two pi radians, right? So one wavelength, like one sine wave is equal to two pi radians. Uh, so how much of this phase uh, makes uh, this, uh, 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 this distance is equal to minus 4 pi by lambda into r. So this is a two-way uh, phase calculation. Okay. So uh, just using the phase of a single signal that is being sent here, uh, uh, that is you will not uh, be able to uh, under, uh, ma measure, you will not be able to use that effectively. It's only when you use two antennas uh, uh, that uh, you can measure the phase of the signal for each antenna and then you can take the difference of the two okay which is uh, minus 4 pi by lambda into delta so delta is the difference of the ranges of the two antennas uh, in the line of the site so this difference in the phase is uh, what helps you to uh, uh, to measure the displacements on the ground. Okay, so you send a signal here, you receive the signal, you received some phase of the signal, you send the signal again, uh, but now you receive a different phase. Okay, so if you subtract the phase of this signal from this signal, the only difference in the phase that will remain is this blue part. And using the, the equation that I've showed here, shown here, this phase can be used to measure how much of this distance the surface has moved. Okay, understanding this concept helps you to know that uh, 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 what are the displacements that has happened on the ground. Okay, so knowing the phase difference here you can actually know that how much of the area has been displaced on the ground and once you know the how much by what distance the uh, the, the area has been displaced on the ground then it has immense applications it can be used
used for landslide studies. It can be used for earthquake studies. It can be used for volcano studies. It can be used for uh, many different applications, uh, which involves the movement on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so a famous term which we use in uh, INSAR is interferogram. So interferogram is an image of the this the phase difference that you obtain between the two images that you have. Okay, so these are the same equation from the last uh, uh, slide that the phase difference I in team implies interferometric is uh, minus four pi by lambda into delta where delta is uh, the difference in the ranges, which denotes this blue part. Okay. But this interferometric uh, phase difference also includes uh, other additions in the phase. That could be due to satellite geometry, uh, due to some of the atmospheric effects, and some noise. So there are uh, standard algorithms uh, that people can use in their own work uh, to remove these, uh, uh, the different additions, and I can actually calculate what is the displacement on the ground. OK, so I will show you one such example of an interferogram. So I do not know if you have uh, heard about uh, the Palu earthquake in, in Indonesia uh, that happened in 2018. So actually using the interferogram, uh, which is uh, an image of the, uh, uh, the difference in the phases of two satellite uh, images, uh, SAR satellite images, you can make an interferogram. Okay, so this interferogram was generated by Dr. Eric Lindsay, uh, who was formerly a postdoc at the Earth Observatory of Singapore, uh, but uh, now he's at the University of Mexico in the US. Uh, you can see uh, here that uh, uh, this interferogram looks very beautiful, very colorful. Uh, it might be a noise for someone who do not understand uh, or who has not worked, uh, I'm sorry, who has not worked in microwave remote sensing. But someone who has uh, worked in microwave remote sensing uh, can understand these, uh, that these interferograms are uh, actually showing you the phase differences. Okay. So here it is goes from minus 3.14 to 3.14, which is actually the value of pi. So it goes from minus pi to pi. Uh, uh, so this uh, shows you the, the, dif the, the phase differences uh, uh, between minus pi and pi. So this is a wrapped. Uh, so there's another technical term, wrapped phase. You need not to concern about that. The only thing you need to know here is that the closer these uh, fringes are, we call these uh, uh, these uh, patterns as one fringe. So the closer the fringes are, uh, the more the deformation is happening. Okay. So when the Palu earthquake happened, so the deformation happened along this area. Okay. So using the interferogram, you can know that uh, the a lot of phase difference values uh, were. Uh, which were very close together were happening in this area. So this uh, actually uh, is showing you the displacement of so the deformation on the ground. In this particular area, uh, people, uh, the scientists thought that the fault where the earthquake happened was actually going into the ocean here. But using the interferogram, they came to know that there is the fault is actually also on the ground itself. Right. So this uh, using this interferogram, you can know that a lot of deformation due to earthquake happened in this area. So in this way, the, the, the microwave remote sensing and the INSAR in particular can, can be used in earthquake studies. OK, uh, uh, you need not to go into the detail. On, on the equation. I just included this uh, for some of the people who might be interested in the audience to know what the, the coherence is. Uh, coherence is, a, is, a, is, a, is a something that measures the quality of an interferogram. OK, so a coherence of value 0 implies that uh, there is no correlation between the two images, and a coherence of value one implies uh, that the images have identical phases. 
So uh, what does that mean? So it means that uh, if a coherence has uh, a value of one, that means that the area was uh, like, for example, if you if if you look where I am pointing my pointer here, uh, the coherence would be one here because it has not displaced in 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 the two satellite images. But uh, in this particular area, uh, the the uh, this is has been displaced, so the coherence uh, would be zero here, or would be a lower value because uh, the area was not similar uh, in between the two images. So that is what the coherence is measuring. It is measuring the correlation between the two images. How similar are the two images uh, in terms of uh, the deformation on the surface of the Earth? Okay, so uh, uh, let me just uh, recap the things that we just studied now. So we moved on uh, from the introduction of the microwave remote sensing to understanding what were the unique uh, uniqueness of uh, microwaves uh, to understanding uh, what are the different sensors that are used nowadays. And then uh, we moved on to understand what uh, is a real and synthetic aperture uh, radars are. What are the disadvantages of uh, real aperture radar and what are the advantages of synthetic aperture radar? Uh, interferometric uh, synthetic aperture radar is a great technique that can be used in uh, deformation studies. Uh, and what is a coherence that measure, what is an interferogram uh, that is an image of the phase differences of the two satellite images? And what is a coherence which measures the quality of the interferogram? So that was all about the theory that uh, uh, was being covered in this uh, and here. Now it's just, uh, so now you can uh, uh, be a little relaxed because now it will just be uh, the photographs and I would be showing you some of the applications of SAR, okay? So this uh, map is uh, from uh, one of my former labs. I was in the Earth Observatory of Singapore, which was uh, doing work on natural hazards in collaboration with NASA and JPL. <clears throat> so you see here, so they produced a flood proxy map. A flood proxy map is a map that shows uh, approximately where the flooded regions are in an area. So in uh, July of this year, uh, there was a big flood in Assam, right? Uh, so uh, they, the, the, <clears throat> the, the members of the lab produced a flood map of this area. Using uh, the, uh, the concepts of SAR, they were able to map that uh, where the flood has happened on the ground. So SAR has a big application in uh, flood monitoring. And also uh, my research interest is also in floods. Okay, so if anyone has any further questions that how SAR uh, more technically can be used to do flood measurements, uh, they are always welcome to email me or maybe ask questions in the in the chat box. Uh, uh, this the the data that was used was uh, from European Space Agency uh, Sentinel One data. So you can see that uh, the some of the areas were being flooded in Assam were uh, rightfully uh, uh, were correctly mapped in 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 this in in the flood map. <clears throat> Moving on, there was a, a volcano eruption in uh, January of this year uh, in Philippines. Um, the volcano that erupted was known as the, the Tal volcano. Uh, this is uh, another application of SAR in uh, trying to find uh, where the deformation has happened uh, near the volcano. Here, so here is the volcano here. You see the pixels here, which some are yellow and some are red. So you can uh, know that uh, uh, the yellow pixels have less deformation and the red pixels have a very high deformation. Okay, so you can see here that in this particular area, uh, it is very red. So the deformation has happened a lot in this particular area. Okay, so this actually helps you in rescue efforts also. If someone was there near the volcano and if, he's, and if the person is stuck somewhere in this place, so it helps, so these kind of map, map helps the, the first responders or the rescue mission people to use such maps and go into the field and look out for people or for damages that has happened. 
okay so uh, uh, coherence uh, which i just told you was used uh, in this map uh, to measure the deformation how that was used uh, is another story uh, but this is one of the one of the major applications of sart that you can use in volcano studies okay so i am sure everyone in the audience uh, must have heard about heard or may, may be grieved about the lebanon explosion that happened in august of this year uh, uh the application of sar uh, uh, was uh, rightfully used uh, to uh, to prepare a map and to send to the the rescue to the first responders here uh you can see that the the city of beirut beirut here uh is being uh, zoomed in here and you can see the 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 type of the damage that has happened here you can see the the red pixels here you can see the yellow pixels so the most damage happened in this area so the ship that was uh, having the chemicals was exploded in somewhere in this region that damaged all the buildings uh, in in particularly in this region uh, and the nearby buildings so here also the concept of coherence and uh, was used uh, to map the the damaged buildings in these area so this is a major application of sar and this map was being used by many agencies uh for responding uh, to, for or for uh, mitigating the effects of the explosion in this area this is another a little bit uh, more technical uh you in uh, uh, the applications of sar the sar can be used uh to map the deformation due to earthquakes as you can see in this figure these are the different fringes the closer the fringes are the more the deformation is in that area so a lot of deformation has happened near the faults in this area uh uh it can uh, so this is another block model for this uh to map the to use uh, this to calculate the slip uh it can also be used uh, for determining the velocities uh, in an area uh, how much is the de deformation velocity deformation that is happening in this area in figure d and e these are the volcanoes uh, these are the 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 tips of the volcanoes and you can see the fringes are much closer here so a lot of deformation must have happened in this area uh you can uh, so for some people who are interested in machine and deep learning um a lot of people do machine and deep learning on the sar data sets itself uh so you can use uh, these uh, machine and deep learning techniques to use uh, the sar data sets and this is particularly the contours of the different probabilities uh that are uh, that are showing you the the deformation that is happening in this area where the volcanoes are okay so i think this is uh, my uh, one of the last slides here uh, which is about the application of sar in urban areas uh you can use the concept of coherence also in or this is particularly uh, known as ps in sar permanent scatterers in sar this is an advanced technique of in sar and uh, i have not covered that in the lecture uh, but people who are interested can go and read that online so you can see here that this shows you the subsidence of uplift in an area uh so the red shows you the subsidence that this area has been subsided and uh, where the construction is happening uh and you can see the other areas <clears throat> uh where the uplift has happened uh, uh mostly uh you cannot see the blue pixels here but you see the green and the yellow that means that these uh, pixels are mostly stable but you see a lot of subsidence has happened in this area where the construction was going on so you can use uh, the 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 sar to also study the subsidence uh, in cities as well okay uh, so these were some some of the references that you can use uh i would say that uh, uh you must so some who are interested and in a lot of material in this uh, uh slides were taken from the microwave radar and radiometric tumor sensing by Olabe et al it's a great book uh, you can read it on your in your own time uh the products that i showed you about the volcanoes and about the lebanon explosion is included in this uh, uh, reference here uh the 
animation about the signal uh, was taken from Twitter uh, from the uh, page of Professor Ian Woodhouse, which is one of the foremost uh, experts on microwave remote sensing in the world. Uh, EO College is one of the online platforms where you can go and learn about microwave remote sensing. And these are the other references uh, that were being used to, to show you some of the pictures here. Uh, this is my last slide here. Uh, for uh, people who are new to microwave remote sensing, uh, I would uh, recommend that if they are interested to learn more about this or if they are interested uh, uh, to understand more about what a microwave remote sensing is, there is an uh, open uh, uh, MOOC. Um, so this is MOOC is, uh, I forgot the whole, the full, def, uh, like the full form, but it's an open line, massive open, open courseware online course, something like that. It's a, uh, it's a course uh, fra, by Professor Franz Mayer, which is also uh, one of the foremost experts on microwave remote sensing. You can, this is a free course. Uh, you can go and learn about that on, on edX. Uh, this is a, a book by Professor Ian Woodhouse, Introduction to Microwave Remote Sensing, a great textbook to understand uh, what a microwave remote sensing is. Uh, you can go on uh, European Space Agency uh, website. Uh, if I click on this, uh, I would uh, go here and then you can look for the different uh, uh, toolboxes here. So Sentinel-1 toolbox, uh, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3. So they are great uh, 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 documents here that you can learn about SAR. Uh, this is a UNAFCO website. Uh, UNAFCO website is a great source to learn about in SAR theory and processing. It's based in uh, US, in Colorado. Uh, but you can go online and look uh, for the different uh, courses that they have. And every year, uh, they also offer courses uh, free online. So you can go and register on these uh, uh, websites uh, to understand more about INSAR. Uh, and finally, this is uh, uh, one of uh, the softwares that are used by a lot of scientists nowadays uh, for understanding about uh, uh, microwave remote sensing, uh, which is known as ICE. So ICE is a scientific uh, and computing environment, uh, interferometric scientific and computing environment. Uh, you can download uh, ICE uh, uh, in your own uh, laptops or desktops. And you can use the, the, uh, this uh, ICE software to do the processing on the satellite images. OK, uh, so. Uh, at the end, I would like to say that uh, uh, I have only touched the surface of uh, microwave remote sensing. There is a lot, a lot more about to learn about microwave remote sensing, um, particularly different techniques uh, that there are. Uh, and uh, because uh, uh, there's an upcoming mission known as NISAR, uh, there will be a lot of opportunity for remote sensing scientists uh, to get the data and to do wonderful research uh, in the field uh, to understand more about India and to understand more about the world itself uh, using uh, the SAR remote sensing. Uh, I would like to conclude my presentation now uh, by saying thank you. Uh, and that is all from me. Uh, over to you. Participants, if you have any queries, you may raise now. Okay, uh, so I can go, I can, if, because I'm still sharing my uh, chat, so I can just go on the chat and look. Uh, okay, uh, so can you post the reference here, uh, some of the report resources to learn SAR? Okay, so I I anticipated that this question will be raised in the in, in the presentation. So as I as I as I've shown you before, uh, maybe now you can take a snapshot of this slide. Uh, uh, and, and I think this is being recorded. I'm not sure whether that will be shared to everyone. 
that is a decision of the host uh, but you can take a picture from your mobile or something uh, um, and you can go online and look at these resources they're great resources and you can learn more about uh, microwave remote sensing here okay mobile tower and mobile phone emit microwave radiation is there any possibility to increase temperature around mobile tower uh, implemented area in certain places we can see so many towers are located uh, you are actually correct in in saying that uh, that a, mo a lot of mobile tower and mobile phone emit microwave ra radiations uh, but uh, uh, they these radiations are in different frequencies uh, than the frequencies uh, that is being used to do the earth observation is there any possibility to increase temperature and of course uh, because they are using their own power so uh, it is the temperature around the, the, the sensor itself, not the tower, but the sensor itself, the temperature is high. So it is always recommended not to, to go close to the sensors or to the towers. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? Okay, how we use in our environment research work. Uh, so in environment research work, uh, you can use uh, the uh, earthquake, uh, sorry, the microwave remote sensing uh, uh, using the different uh, techniques that is known as uh, polarimetry, uh, polarimetric uh, remote sensing. Uh, so the polarimetry actually measures the surface scattering and uh, based on the environment, when you have a lot of uh, chemicals and all these things, they changes the characteristics of the surface. So measuring the surface scattering properties, uh, you can actually understand about the, the surface itself where the chemicals are. I hope I understand your question and maybe answer the question uh, accordingly. Could you tell a few words on the application of SAR in agriculture application? Yes, uh, SAR is uh, 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 used a lot in agriculture applications. I would like if I like polarimetry, uh, um let me create uh, a so uh polarimetry is a uh, is uh, is another uh, uh, sub branch of microwave remote sensing uh, so there are different uh, polarizations in uh, microwave remote sensing so for example if you have hh polarization hv and pv polarization so these polarizations uh, can be used uh, to do the measurements of the different properties of the in the, in the agriculture itself. So these different polarizations give you different information, and uh, using those information, you can do uh, you can actually do uh, land cover classification in the agriculture field also. So if you are interested in uh, doing in the agriculture field, I would advise you to explore about more about polarimetry. Okay. Someone please uh, mute their mic. It is causing a little disturbance. Uh, can you please tell a few words on the application? Okay. Uh, feedback link. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we do lithology mapping using SAR? Yes, uh, you can use the SAR to do lithology mapping. Uh, uh, it be, because in the lithology mapping, you have the different uh, uh, the rock types uh, that you have, uh, and also it is uh, uh, it is it depends on the on the on the on the structure of the surface itself. So because the structure of the surface uh, is uh, being uh, different. For different kind of rocks, so you get a different kind of scattering. And uh, again, I would advise you to, if you are interested in lithology mapping, uh, explore the polarimetry. So polarimetry uh, microwave remote sensing has great potential in lithology mapping as well. Uh, could you please help me regarding the classification of vegetation by deep learning tool using SAR? So. Uh, you can use uh, the different polarizations uh, for the classification of vegetation. Of course, you can use deep learning tools uh, such as convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks on these data sets uh, to do the classification of the, on the vegetation. Uh, uh, nowadays, a lot of people are using uh, the deep learning tools uh, using SAR. And I would recommend that you go online and search for uh, the recent papers 
there are a lot of people papers that use deep learning uh, tools on SAR data sets. Uh, what is the application on of urban mapping using synthetic SAR images? Can you please say a few words? Uh, <clears throat> OK. Uh, in urban mapping, uh, SAR, because the signal is coming uh, towards the uh, in, 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 in the urban areas, uh, it hits the ground. So yeah, there is a concept known as double bounce. So the signal gets uh, bounced uh, from the uh, from the buildings that are in the urban areas and reflected back to the satellites. So in that way, you can actually measure based on the double bounce or, or the strength of the double bounce that uh, what are the features on the ground. Okay, uh, uh, the other technique is known as uh, permanent scatterers uh, in SAR, PS in SAR. Uh, PS in SAR actually looks at uh, the, the features uh, which are uh, permanent and semi-permanent in urban areas. So you can use a PS in SAR uh, for urban mapping as well. OK. Uh, is a fuzzy uh, ART map is related to this? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what do you mean by ART. Can you, can you expand the term ART? Okay, uh, fuzzy alternative to fuzzy map is related to this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot understand your question. Maybe I'm not that familiar with the. Are you are you are you asking? Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that there are uh, fuzzy methods that people use on SAR datasets also, uh, but uh, I haven't worked on the alternative to fuzzy maps. Uh, so I'm sorry, I cannot answer you on this question. Okay, so digital elevation models and digital uh, triangulation model, how does it differ each other? So <clears throat> actually what is happening in uh, the so the digital elevation model is a model of the elevation of the surface of the Earth, right? Uh, so SAR is used to derive the digital elevation model using the difference in the phase, uh, of, of, uh, in, in, in the phase itself uh, when it is uh, it is moving. So uh, when the so uh, uh, it uses the concept of par parallax, okay? So there are two satellites that are moving together, but because of the different positions of the satellites, there is a parallax, okay? So based on that parallax and because of the different positions of the satellites, the distance that is of the signal that is traveling from the satellite to the ground and coming back to the satellite is different. So based on that, uh, you can actually uh, calculate the difference in the phase to find that how much is the height on the, on the surface of the Earth so that is how you are calculating the digital elevation model. In uh, digital triangulation models, uh, you need at least uh, three points to do the triangulation itself. Uh, triangulation are used by GPS satellites to know your locations. Uh, it is not uh, extensively used in SAR. Uh, there is stereo uh, SAR uh, methods that might be using the digital uh, triangulation models. But most, uh, mostly it is used in GPS and not that uh, broadly in SAR. Uh, please refer some open source software for microwave data processing in open source SAR data download websites. OK. So uh, as I told you that uh, ICE. ICE here is an open source software. You can download it and start working on it uh, if you go in. In if, if, if you are familiar with some coding, you can go in the Anaconda Cloud ICE. Uh, you can download the Anaconda uh, package. And within that package, you have ICE2. You can install this package and right away start working on the SAR datasets. 
uh, for for the free data that you have, uh, either you can go on on the ASF uh, Vertex. So this is ASF uh, data search. And is a uh, uh, data explorer. EO browser. So this is uh, ASF uh, data vertex. Uh, you can zoom in in any area. Uh, you have to first create an account. You can zoom in in any area. Uh, you can then uh, keep on uh, uh, clicking uh, here. And then you will find uh, what are the images that are being available. And then you can download those images from the from this website. Uh, there are different. Uh, there's LOS Pulsar. Uh, there are also uh, historical data sets that are included, such as uh, uh, Cersei, okay, uh, from 1994, so it's pretty old. Uh, you can use radar set data, ERS data, so there are a lot many data that you, you can also use the, the aerial star data sets as well. EO browser is uh, another initiative from the European Space Agency. Uh, from here, you can search for the data, uh, which is the Sentinel data itself. Uh, this is the most complete resource here. So you can either download Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 data from these websites, or even Sentinel-3 data from here. So these are the two websites uh, manually that you can go and download the data. Uh, uh, what is, was your other question? OK, so I think I answered your question. So ICE is one. The other one is uh, the Sentinel-1 toolbox, uh, which is uh, SNAP, uh, this one. <clears throat> so SNAP is a, uh, is a toolbox. If you are not interested in doing the coding, you can download SNAP. And it is a user-friendly uh, graphical user interface is given. You can use the graphical user interface of SNAP. Uh, to to do the same kind of processing as you can do with ICE2. OK. Uh, <clears throat> OK, uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, I hope uh, you were able to, I was able to maybe inspire you or maybe learn more about what a microwave remote sensing is. OK, uh, regarding aerosol, particulate matter classification, upper processor, can we use SAR? Of course, you can use SAR for, uh, uh, for aerosol uh, and classification as well. As uh, I told you in one of the slides here that uh, uh, here that uh, the, this interferometric is, has uh, some of the atmospheric effects here as well. So usually, uh, while making these kind of work for the surface of the Earth, we remove this atmospheric effects because it's a noise for us. But because you are interested in doing the aerosols, uh, this would be a signal for you, right? So there are a few studies that uh, you can use the uh, SAR to do aerosol, uh, uh, aerosol mapping as well. OK, uh, any more questions you have? I still have 15 minutes. <laughs> so this is the longest uh, time uh, I have spoken in many, many months. So thank you for giving this <laughs> opportunity so that I was able to speak uh, for about uh, two hours straight. <laughs> so if anyone has uh, any questions interested in doing master's or PhD, we have a good program in IT Roorkee. Uh, about uh, on the geomatics engineering. Uh, we teach uh, not only microwave remote sensing, but uh, a lot of uh, many other things. Uh, so you can uh, contact me, or you can. Uh... Okay. So you can contact me or contact other professors in the department. Uh, uh, there is, uh, I wouldn't, uh, it's it's not a platform to uh, popularize IIT Roorkee, so I would name IIT Kanpur and IIT Bombay. So they are also good institutes where they have a strong uh, uh, remote sensing master's and PhD program. So if uh, 
anyone in 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 the, in the bachelors or the if any student is here who is interested to do masters or phd uh, uh they are welcome to give gate and apply to these uh, programs okay uh thank you for your uh, uh, good comments uh I still have a few more minutes. Uh, I would like the host to say something uh, if there are any, any last questions to answer, and then I can stop sharing my screen. Participants, if you have any other queries, you may raise now. So shall we wind up the session? Ah uh, yes, please. Okay. We must find the time to thank the people who make a difference in our lives. The more we express thanks, the more gratitude we feel. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to our guest speaker, Dr. Alok Bharatwaj sir, for sparing his valuable time for making this session a very meaningful one. Thank you so much, sir. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Finally, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the participants for your active participation. I hope you all find this, this session fruitful and beneficial for future venture. Thank you one and all for your cordial cooperation. Have a nice day. Participants, the feedback link is posted in the chat box. Please submit your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, it was uh, a nice experience for me as well to give the presentation to uh, so many uh, interested people. And uh, uh, also thank you to the Francis Xavier uh, Engineering College uh, for inviting me to give the presentation. Uh, I have posted my email on the in the chat box if anyone is interested to know more about uh, uh, remote sensing or microwave remote sensing or uh, they can email me uh, I'm open uh, to answer their queries uh, and yes uh, thank you so much thank you so much sir so should I leave the call now ah yes sir okay thank you so much thank you sir